The 2006 outdoor racing season is officially in motion with the Rolex 24 at Daytona. I'm Connie Legrand. And I'm Bob Jenkins. The event gets things going for speed weeks, which culminate with the Daytona 500. Now, we'll recap the Grand Am race in a moment. While Daytona awaits the arrival of the stock cars, most of the NASCAR news this week came from the track off the track during the annual media tour, and the big story revolves around next year's car. The car of tomorrow will begin competition in 2007 and 16 Nextel Cup events. NASCAR says the changes will increase safety, competition, and will save the team's money in the long run. The Toyota Camry will also begin cup competition next year with three two-car teams. Bill Davis Racing, Michael Waltrip Racing, and a newly formed Team Red Bull. The Japanese automaker will also compete in the Bush Series. And NASCAR's Drive for Diversity program has selected eight minority and female drivers chosen from more than 300 applicants to participate in the Dodge Weekly Series this year. We'll have much more on the changes throughout this hour. A NASCAR driver was among the victors in the 44th running of the Rolex 24 at Daytona. Casey Mears and his teammates, Indy Racing League drivers Dan Weldon and Scott Dixon, pulled off the win for Chip Ganassi Racing. Bob Varsha provided play-by-play -play for Speed's live coverage of the monumental upset. At this weekend's running of the Rolex 24 here at Daytona International Speedway, we learned once again that endurance sports car racing plays no favorites. In previous years, a galaxy of international racing stars showed up hoping to win, only to be turned away by the Rolex Grand Am Series regulars. This year, all of that changed. Record-setting pole sitter Lucas Lohr led away in a Porsche-powered Crawford, and the typical Daytona action began early, as car after car found either an opponent or the trackside wall. A 66 car field, 11 larger than previous years, saw lots of action. Cars spinning, particularly in the kink area, of the infield portion of this 3.56 mile circuit. And that, of course, led to debris in the radiators. Passes for the lead, there were 39 in all among more than a dozen of the cars in the field. A particularly good story, the pole sitting Porsche Crawford suffered half shaft failures, several of them. At one point dropped all the way back to 36th in the field before forcing their way forward in the hands of Lucas Lohr, Mike Rockefeller, and Patrick Long. Hour four saw this collision. Emmanuel Collard running into a spinning GT car, taking the defending champions from SunTrust Racing out of the event. Another incident at Calamity Corner. Forrest Barber spun. Rocky Moran Jr. got into him, but both cars would continue. In hour five, with the shadows growing long, Darren Law, David Donahue, and Sasha Mason came forward in their Porsche-powered fab car. Oil down in turns one and two caused some problems. IRL veteran Alex Barron there damaging the nose of his Daytona prototype. Into the night, temperatures began to fall, grip even more elusive, and we saw plenty of spins and crashes, eventually removing half of the 66-car field. Pretty typical Daytona attrition. NASCAR star Rusty Wallace in his Daytona debut would not see the checkered flag. Continued problems in his Pontiac-powered prototype eventually put him on the sidelines, partnering Danica Patrick and a couple of other big sports car stars. Most spectacular incident, Kelly Collins in his GT class, GTOR, making its Rolex debut, suffered a rear suspension failure and a big spin. Deep in the nighttime hours, engine failure, sideline former Rolex winner Scott Pruitt, who thanked his crew, but he, Luis Diaz, and Max Pappas were done. Working their way forward despite problem after problem, Lure, Rockefeller, and Long, we're once again fighting for the lead when the sun rose. And that's when Eddie Cheever departed with Christian Fittipaldi and Patrick Carpentier after a sterling and very clean run in their Lexus-powered Crawford chassis. In the final hour, Darren Law, driving the Red Bull car for Brumos Racing, suffered the greatest indignity of all, a left rear tire failure that cost them third place and a podium position after a hard-fought race. In the end, Scott Dixon brought Chip Ganassi and his fellow teammates across the line. The first time this race was won by anything but Grand Am Rolex regulars. In the GT class, Randy Popst brought a 911 GT3 Cup car home. 61st class victory for Porsche. But overall, Dixon, Dan Weldon, and Casey Mears made it the first time ever for some of the international stars who have come to this race to come away with a Rolex 24 victory by one lap over A.J. Allmendinger and Justin Wilson from the Champ Car Series driving with series regulars Oswaldo Negri.
and Mark Patterson. Now let's hear from our overall winners. It's a lot of fun, and especially with me and Dan becoming new teammates, it uh, should be good bonding. But uh, this race is always difficult, you know. It's so hard to win, and I just can't believe we finally did it, and it's all credit to the team. i got to thank everybody at uh, Target Chip Ganassi Racing because, uh, you know, to be honest, we had, we had some stuff through the night that they took care of, and uh, not, ju not just the O2 crew, the O1 crew, the whole team worked very hard for this. So uh, it's a fantastic achievement for everybody involved. Really, you can't say enough about these guys. I mean, they were they got some quick changes done in the middle of the night that a lot of guys couldn't do, and uh, kept us in the race. So, I mean, we spent the least amount of time in the pits, and that's what it took. We had a fast car, and uh, I just couldn't be happier. The margin of victory in the GT class, three laps over one of those Porsche GTOs. Now let's hear from the winners of GT at this year's Rolex 24. That is fantastic to get first in a Rolex 24. Now it's kind of the typical winning story. Our Porsche ran perfectly the whole race. And it's a team sport, and it was a team win. And, uh, you know, the car gets some credit because it ran perfectly all 24 hours. David Hobbs joins me now to analyze. David, we covered a record for the Daytona prototype era, 734 laps, a brutal pace in this year's race. Well, practice and qualifying show, we would probably do that. It was incredibly fast pace and also incredibly close. We had five cars on the same tenth in qualifying, and the race did get up to a hell of a pace. We thought there were going to be a lot of caution flags because of that, but in fact there wasn't. There were a lot more retirements than we thought from mechanical problems. And the O2 car had a bit luck in the middle of the night. They had to come in and change the alternator and the braking system on the car. Just as they came in to do it, the caution flag came out. It only took them three laps to do it instead of about six which would have been under the green. So they had a bit of luck there, and that may have been the winning margin. We saw history made on the top of the podium. Now let's hear from some of the other stars who fared not so well. This is the race. I mean, this, this is such an important race for us. Although, you know, we'd, you, don't, you don't get in all the way. It's awful long, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know if we need to be running this long or not. But no, I'm having a good time, man, really. It, it's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. And uh, I wish I was just a little bit quicker. I have a whole new respect for preparation, pit crew, for equipment, because, you know, if it can make it 24 hours, it deserves that credit. And, uh, and I think it's fun. We're... Um, Obviously bitterly disappointed, but we're very glad that we were here, and um, it's a good start speed-wise, and the team and everything did very well. There's nothing you can say about it, really. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll be back again. So now with the Rolex out of the way, it's time to turn attention to the rest of the Grand Am sports car season. The next round is in Mexico City, March 4th, right here on Speed. That's all from Daytona International Speedway. Now back to the studio. And Friday's tune-up to the Rolex 24 featured an 88-car field, but none in the Grand Am Cup 200 was faster to the finish than the Porsche of Eric Lux and Charles Espenlaub. John Schmidt and Dave Roush took the street tuner class win in their Honda Accord. Nothing but Hondas are behind IndyCar Series drivers this year. Robin Miller is ready to tell us what he learned from two days of testing in Phoenix. It was a big week for IndyCar Series champ Dan Weldon. Days before winning the Rolex 24, he turned the fastest lap in IRL testing for his new team, Chip Ganassi Racing. The two-day session at Phoenix International Raceway was the first of the season, which starts, by the way, at Homestead, March the 26th. 15 cars, 16 drivers ran 3,100 incident-free miles at PIR. Weldon's teammate Scott Dixon was second, followed by Penske drivers Elio Castro Nevis and Sam Hortis Jr. Thomas Schechter and Ed Carpenter shared a car for Vision Racing, owned by IRL founder Tony George, who I know always enjoys listening to our Robin Miller. After the IRL's two-day test here at Phoenix International Raceway, we learned quite a few things. First and foremost, we learned it's nice to have a Honda. Ask Chip Ganassi and Roger Penske. They haven't had one in the last couple of years, and they've struggled. But now that everybody in the IRL is powered by Honda, I think you're going to see these two teams back at the top where they always were. Now, the biggest thing that keeps driving me right now is, is, is trying to win in this team. And, uh, you know, when, when, you've, when you've been with a successful team and you've, you've won a lot of races, you, you want to prove to everybody that you can do it in another team because, um, I'm not going to lie, it, it raises my profile and it, I think it will raise people's respect level of it. It's a pretty big change, you know, across <laughs> the board with the car and uh, the whole package is, is very nice. And 
I could tell uh, we did a commercial shoot just before Christmas, and you could definitely tell just pulling out of the pits. So it's uh, <laughs> it's a nice feeling. At least everybody's got the same stuff now, so it's back down to the teams and the drivers. Well, we've been saying over the past couple of years, we don't want anything more than everybody else has. We just want the same thing. So I guess we got our wish. We've got a good opportunity here to hopefully show we're as good as we think we are. If we can get some consistency out of the car, uh, I think we'll be happy. And so far, uh, you know, we, we felt like the car is a little bit more consistent. So we're going to work that direction and um, and hope that we're not at such a disadvantage as we were, were last year. The other big story on the track, Vision Racing. They were pretty much a field filler last year with Ed Carpenter and a Toyota engine. Well, now they've got Thomas Schechter added to the mix. Ed Carpenter's got a teammate. They've got Honda Power. They've got Dave Cripps as the engineer. They were seventh and eighth after two days and raised quite a few eyebrows with those speeds. If you look at the results of Vision, they certainly need to upgrade it. And, and if I can come here and change some things around and, and get this car to be competitive, you know, it, it will raise my profile, and that's exactly what I want to do. We're making a lot of changes from, from the engineering all the way across the board. I mean, last year we definitely... We're doing things on a tight budget, and this year we're trying to take the team to the next level. The other kid that had everybody talking was Marco Andretti. 18 years old, a lot of us, including Mario and myself, said, hey, this guy needs more seasoning. You don't want to throw him to the wolves. It's too much. He didn't have any experience on ovals. But I'll tell you what, there's nothing more daunting than Phoenix International Raceway. In a two-day practice session, this kid held his own, never made a mistake, and looked like a veteran. So he's probably going to prove us all wrong before the season's over. We're still running a little more downforce than everybody else, just, just for a pure comfort level. But, uh, you know, we, weren't, we're, we're, we didn't come here to, to be up on the speed charts. You know, we, weren't, we came just to get used to running on a short oval, which definitely is a challenge. He's just been way beyond his years. And... And, I, you know, that's one of the main reasons why I felt uh, that he can handle handle this. You know, obviously he has got doesn't have the experience, but that was the other thing is he has three great teammates. Last but not least, there were 15 cars here at PIR, and i got news for you. It's going to be hard to see many more than that at the Homestead Opener because you've got Panther Racing, Dreyer, Ryan Bolt, and Eddie Cheever not being here. Doesn't look like they might be anywhere but Indy this year. They don't have the budget to run the full IRL season. And I can't imagine when Tony George started this thing 11 years ago with 25 or 26 cars, he thought it'd get to this point already. 15 cars, 16 cars, not what you want to see for the season opener, kids. Here are the other speeds from the session. Koski Matsura returns for Super Aguri Racing. Ray Hall Letterman Racing will run three cars, Buddy Rice, Danica Patrick, and Paul Dana, who brings along ethanol sponsorship. In 2007, the IRL will run on 100%. Toyota will have to shine to match its success in USAC's National Midget Series. Yeah, on its first outing last Sunday at the Copper World Classic in Phoenix, a Steve Lewis-owned machine powered by Toyota went to victory lane. In the early going, Dave Steele in the white number 91 chased the blue car, Bobby East, on the one-mile fast track. But then East developed a mechanical problem. He slid into the wall and was finished for the afternoon. Smooth sailing for Steele after that as the pole sitter won the midget portion of the Copper Classic for the second time. Bobby was pretty strong, especially at the beginning, and we, uh, that's about all we had. Um, you know, something happened to him. We, we was gaining on him a little bit, and, uh, you know, our car was pretty good at the end. But, you know, here with these, these midgets, uh, it's, uh, you know, restarts play a big part of it. And uh, Ed Pink with that Toyota engine, ours was pretty good. Um, and to come out of the box here and, and get a, a, a fast time and a win for Toyota, uh, Team ASC Oakley, um, it, it, it's pretty pretty big deal, I think. Steele beat Michael Lewis, Jay Drake, Cole Carter, and Ron Gregory in the midget portion of the 29th annual Copper Classic. Some of Steele's rivals say he stole the Silver Crown portion of the Copper Classic. Coming up, both sides weigh in on the controversy. But our Robin Miller gets the last word on this revamped series. The debut of the new USAC Silver Crown Series pavement car started with controversy. Only a dozen cars were ready to go at last weekend's Copper World Classic in Phoenix, and just 10 made it to the track, mid accusations that four of them were illegal. Now you can tell your grandkids you saw this, the first green flag for a new era in Silver Crown Racing. That's Dave Steele leading Bud Cady. It finished that way, 50 laps, zero lead changes. The Man of Steel goes wire to wire and doesn't stop until he pulls into victory lane. While he celebrated, his car owner did some verbal sparring with the guy who owns Katie's car. I think we were racing for first in class today. Uh, CNR came out with a car that was uh, totally illegal. Uh, you know, it broke every infraction you can as far as aerodynamic devices, as far as uh, the way the fuel cell is mounted, the way the chassis is constructed. 
I'm under the impression Chris says he's broke no rules. Uh, my rule book that I've got here, I've got everything highlighted um, that he did wrong. Um, it's pretty blatant and obvious. Bruce Ashmore and I uh, collectively designed that car totally out of the rule book. I mean, every, everything there is right out of USAC's rules, same rule book everybody else had. You know, if they want to, uh, you know, change the rules over what the book is, that, that's their prerogative, and, and we'll go with whatever they want to do. Despite what he said and he said, here are the final results, which mirror the point standings following the first Silver Crown event of the season. Speed's Robin Miller has his own opinion on the outcome. The new look USAC Silver Crown race here at Phoenix, well, to critique it honestly, it wasn't much. They started 10 cars. They're ugly. They don't turn. They aren't as fast as midgets. And I think what you have to understand here is, let's look at what this used to be. The Copper World Classic used to be the Super Bowl for open wheel guys. Midgets, sprints, super modified, silver crown cars. Last year alone, there were 48 cars here. 37 of them took the green flag. Well, because USAC has listened to the ISC, ISC says, USAC, you need to change your silver crown division. We need you to come run with us. Like, it's going to matter. They're still going to pick the best drivers, and they know it comes from USAC. But USAC goes ahead and blows up this division that had 65 cars last year, one of its strongest most endearing traditional divisions. They've blown it up for these ugly things they ran here today. And maybe somewhere down the road, this thing will turn out to be a good deal and there'll be 50 of these cars running around. And if it is successful, NASCAR is going to take it away from USAC anyway. We know that. But the bottom line to remember here is this was once a great, great event. It was what everybody looked forward to starting the season out outdoors at the Copper World Classic. Now, not only do competitors not look forward to it, Neither do the fans, because there were 3,000 people here today, folks. There used to be 30,000. Nice job, USAC. Well, USAC hopes to double its silver crown car count for the next race at Homestead in late March. And there's been a change in the guest list for this year's International Race of Champions. We'll hear about it coming up on Speed News. Last week, we ran down the list of drivers invited to this year's International Race of Champions series. Already, there's a change. Ryan Newman is in, Carl Edwards out, and here's why. Edwards is going to run both the NASCAR Nextel Cup and Bush Series, and a scheduling conflict has caused him to withdraw from the elite field. To be invited to the IROC series is, um, I mean, something that I, I can't even describe. You know, uh, the first time I went to Kenny Schrader's shop to visit him, he showed me his IROC car, you know, and uh, I thought that was so neat. And I'm really disappointed that I'm not going to be able to run the series because of a scheduling conflict. The last race is starts at the same time as the Bush Series event in Memphis. So um, hopefully I get an invitation next year, you know, um, and we don't have a scheduling conflict. But we just, we've been trying to resolve it, and we ended up having to, to say we're not going to be able to do it. The IROC Series will compete at Daytona twice this year, once on the Tri-Oval and also on the road course. Events in Texas and Atlanta are also included in the 2006 schedule. All four races naturally here on Speed. And you can catch us one week from Saturday as we return to Saturday and Sunday editions of Speed News for Speed Weeks in the 2006 in the Dodge Weekly Series this year. We'll have much more on the changes throughout this hour. A NASCAR driver was among the victors in the 44th running of the Rolex 24 at Daytona. Casey Mears and his teammates, Indy Racing League drivers Dan Weldon and Scott Dixon, pulled off the win for Chip Ganassi Racing. Bob Varsha provided play-by-play -play for Speed's live coverage of the monumental upset. At this weekend's running of the Rolex 24 here at Daytona International Speedway, we learned once again that endurance sports car racing plays no favorites. In previous years, a galaxy of international racing stars showed up hoping to win, only to be turned away by the Rolex Grand Am Series regulars. This year, all of that changed. <laughs> Record-setting pole sitter Lucas Lohr led away in a Porsche-powered Crawford and... Bob Jenkins, the event gets things going for speed weeks, which culminate with the Daytona 500. Now, we'll recap the Grand Am race in a moment. While Daytona awaits the rival of the stock cars, most of the NASCAR news this week came from the track off the track during the annual media tour, and the big story revolves around next year's car. The car of tomorrow will begin competition in 2007 in 16 Nextel Cup events. NASCAR says the changes will increase safety, competition, and will save the team's money in the long run. The Toyota Camry will also begin cup competition next year with three two-car teams. Bill Davis Racing, Michael Waltrip Racing, and a new 
newly formed Team Red Bull. The Japanese automaker will also compete in the Bush Series. And NASCAR's Drive for Diversity program has selected eight minority and female drivers chosen from more than 300 applicants to participate. The 2006 outdoor racing season is officially in motion with the Rolex 24 at Daytona. I'm Connie Legrand. And I'm Bob.